Senakoto, Arimai, thank you all for coming to this UC Connect lecture. My name is Jack Heineman, and before I start, I just want to make a few uh, routine safety announcements. Uh, in the case of a disaster, too bad. No, in the case of disaster, such as an earthquake, stay where you are until you get instruction. Uh, in the case of some other kind of disaster, like a fire, there will be uh, staff who come in and direct you to the appropriate place. There are exits behind us and to the side, and there's also toilets to the side. We prefer you use them, um, even if it does interrupt the talk. Uh, let's see. Oh, I'm also supposed to tell you that uh, I'll talk for about 40 minutes or so, 40, 45 minutes, and then we have about a quarter of an hour for questions and discussion. Um, now, before I start on the main feature of my presentation, I just also want to acknowledge a little bit of my journey to this place. Uh, I was, you may be able to tell from my accent, uh, born in the US and raised and educated there uh, in initially in the um, lands of the unceded Ho-Chunk Nation, unceded lands of the Ho-Chunk Nation in south, south central Wisconsin, what we now call that. I then did my graduate work in an area that we now call uh, western central Oregon, and then moved to Montana on the lands, the unceded lands of the Salish, where I worked at the National Institutes of Health. Before coming here to Aotearoa, New Zealand, where I'm now very privileged to live and work on the lands of the First Nations Maori people. Okay, now, what I would like to talk to you about tonight is antibiotic resistance. And the story I'm going to tell is a story that involves many different people, some of whom are here tonight. And I first want to acknowledge their contribution, their significant and essential contribution to the story that I'll be telling. Uh, the people you see pictured here are largely congregated over there. So if there's, <laughs> excellent. So if there's any part of the story that you don't believe or you find a little upsetting, please direct yourselves to this side of the room. <laughs> but I do want to uh, shout out to our partners and our funders um, who have helped make this story uh, possible. Now you might be asking yourself, can we please have a break from the apocalypse? We see apocalyptic stories all the time. We've got the pandemic, climate change, the potential for nuclear war. And yes, you may have a break from the apocalypse tonight. We're going to have a little popcorn. You can sit back and relax. Oh, I'm sorry. It turns out that we can't give you popcorn. Uh, one of the reasons is because the bags that we keep and make the popcorn in are full of what we call forever chemicals, PFASs, that have a five-year half-life in your blood, and we're only just beginning to understand their toxic effects on people. So I'm sorry you don't get popcorn tonight. So yes, this is a sort of doomsday talk, and it's a different doomsday than you might be hearing most frequently. So instead of talking about climate change and nuclear war, I'm going to be talking about a couple of less popular uh, doomsdays called antimicrobial resistance and chemical pollution. But though I'm going to focus tonight on this smaller number of doomsdays, if you are interested in learning more about different ways in which humanity will end themselves on Earth. I wrote this article here for the online magazine, The Conversation, and there you'll find a more comprehensive list of uh, apocalyptic doomsdays. You might be wondering, well, is this just going to be another doomsday talk, another kind of doomsday talk? Hopefully, this will not be as depressing 
as many other ways to talk about the apocalypse. But I do have to warn you that my main message is technology won't be your savior. We can't wait for the possibility that a technology will be invented tomorrow to put off taking action today. All right, it's been a long time now. You've been listening to my monologue. I want to engage you a little bit in some activity. I'm going to take a poll. I'm going to offer you two possible places to swim. <laughs> the place on the left is characterized by having very small numbers of fecal coliform bacteria. So your chance of being infected by them is low. And the swimming hole on the right has a lot more of those fecal coliform bacteria. Your chance of being infected is much higher. Now, don't be afraid to vote, but please only vote once. Who would prefer to swim in the swimming hole on the left? All right, it, it looked pretty convincing, but are there any who are holding out for the right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yes, you are psychologically prepared for the apocalypse. <laughs> I'm, gonna change, I'm gonna change the situation a little bit and re-poll you. The swimming hole and the of infection are low. But the bacteria in that water are antibiotics. The place on the right, though your chances of infection are high because of the high concentration of fecal coliforms, there are very few that are resistant to antibiotics. Now, for some odd reason, you're not allowed to not swim. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the zombies are coming, and the zombies are afraid of water, so always choose uncertainty over certain death. Which of you now prefer, still, the left swimming hole? Uh, let the record show, noticeably fewer of you raised your hands. Positive control. How many of you then would choose the right swimming hole? Yeah, a big switch. I have to say, that that is the common response. And you're doing a rational risk assessment. You're thinking, well, in both cases, there is a probability I won't get infected. But if I am infected by bacteria from the left swimming hole, I'm much less likely to be saved by antibiotics. So as uncomfortable as it may be to get an infection, I have a good probability of being cured of that infection if I'm infected by an E. coli from the right swimming hole. And that is what I often see when I poll audiences with that question. Yet, nowhere in the world are water quality risk assessments informed by the loads of antibiotic resistant potential pathogens in our surface water. You're informed by coli numbers so fecal coliform counts, which give us some indication of the likelihood that animals have contributed, including people, have contributed to the bacteria in that water. And therefore, we can assess the potential for pathogens to be in that water. But that's as far as your information goes. So we have this gap in knowledge about what the risks are for encountering bacteria that might cause an incurable infection. And that was the subject of the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor's Office recent report on antibiotic resistance and infectious diseases in Aotearoa. And I'm going to highlight two parts of that report this evening. Part of the recommendations number six which is the recommendation that there be regular environmental reporting. And that reporting prioritizes surveys 
of emerging microbes, drugs, and genes that we find in that water. And recommendation number eight, which is that we develop a more holistic view of antimicrobial susceptibility, that our goal should not be to resist resistance. Our goal should be to never have resistance at all. That we should be selecting for an environment that has bacteria that remain completely susceptible to antibiotics so that we're never in the situation of failing to be able to cure a curable infection using our antimicrobial agents. What is antibiotic resistance? There are technical and clinical terms and definitions for the words I'm using, but I don't think they matter to us tonight. I think it's sufficient to say that what we're talking about is any increase in the ability of a disease-causing microorganism to survive exposure to an antibiotic. It doesn't matter how much more they can survive in. It matters that they can survive in more than they used to. Because every small increment in the ability to survive, concentration increment for survival of those bacteria or microorganisms, erodes clinical outcomes. It takes very little increase in the resistance level of a bacterium to cause the underdosing of a patient with antibiotics, resulting in higher mortality and morbid morbidity. So we're talking about not just clinically resistant bacteria, although I will be talking about those too, but any bacteria that cause a threat to us because they are more resistant than we expect them to be. And it's a worldwide phenomenon. Antibiotic resistance is everywhere, and it's increasing. So it is a global existential threat because now there are species of pathogenic bacteria for which they are resistant to nearly all clinically useful drugs. There are some strains of those species that are resistant to all clinically available drugs. And when I say resistant there, I mean resistant in the clinical sense, where a patient cannot be dosed with enough antibiotic to arrest that infection. I'm going to be giving you a viewpoint from E. coli. And as my colleagues here at the university will know, I'm kind of a fan of E. coli. So I'd like to uh, re-emphasize that, uh, like me, others have also noticed that E. coli has a rich history, and it is biology's rock star. So some of us might think of it as just being a load of poo. If we get close enough, we can find that E. coli has much to offer. So yes, some strains of E. coli will kill you, given the chance. But for the most part, it's not our biggest threat. It's a great indicator, though, in the environment of when there may be a threat. So we're going to look at those threats from E. coli's point of view. And that E. coli might be closer than you think. You know it's in your gut, and you know it comes out of you, usually in your toilet. But when you flush that toilet, you also create an aerosol. So on the left, you see the head of a toothbrush that a former student, Deb Paul, had in, had in the toilet, not actually in the toilet bowl, but in the room. And she embedded that toothbrush head into a medium that specifically allows E. coli to grow. And what you can see here in these little blue spots are um, the E. coli growing off from that toothbrush. Now, at the time, Deb did have flatmates. 
you know, it, the sabotage can't be entirely ruled out here. But I would have thought there would be a lot more E. coli if sabotage were the explanation. But perhaps pictures like this will give you a little bit more incentive to completely close the lid before you flush. We are also a nation that still enjoys wild harvested foods. Sophie, who's here in the audience, and next week <laughs> defends her PhD thesis, and she's not at all nervous, and she shouldn't be. She samples E. coli in rivers around Canterbury, and this is a picture from North Canterbury looking at E. coli levels in the water, those are the blue bars, and on watercress. These are popular watercress harvesting locations. And what you can see in this picture is that the E. coli levels, the concentrations of fecal coliforms, is upwards of 1,000 per 100 mils of water. So these often exceed even our recommendations for swimming. And the watercress tends to have as many or even higher concentrations of the fecal coliform bacteria. So you might find it difficult now in the New Zealand environment to avoid E. coli. It is not just in urban rivers, it's also in rural rivers. Sophie has also described the spectrum of antibiotic resistances from the E. coli that she gets from wild foods and the, and the waters in which she finds them. What you see here on the left is an indication of how frequently more than one antibiotic reside in the same bacterium. So we look at, what is this, three, six, eight different antibiotics that describe roughly the chemical spectrum of antibiotics that we have available to us. Not every derivative of every drug, but a good range of the biochemical activities. And how often they co-occur in the same bacterium. And what she finds is that some strains have six, seven, eight antibiotics sim resistances simultaneously. And this is not uncommon. We can find these multi-drug resistant isolates from the environment even without pre-selection. So just growing the E. coli on a medium permissive for all E. coli and screening them sec secondarily you can still pick them up because they're at such a high concentration sometimes. So multi-drug resistant bacteria are commonly found in the environment now here in Aotearoa, at least at Canterbury. But also the concentration of the drug to which these bacteria are resistant is alarmingly high. So in this picture here, a few isolates one from an urban stream, the Avon, and one from a rural stream, the Silver Stream. These isolates were resistant to the frontline antibiotic ciprofloxacin. This is the go-to drug for E. coli urinary, urinary tract infections. Ciprofloxacin is an entirely human synthesized drug. There's no analog of ciprofloxacin in nature. And when it was introduced in the 1980s, it was thought it would be the miracle wonder drug for urinary tract infections because there shouldn't have been pre-existing resistance genes to this drug. Within five years, clinical resistance emerged. And here we find evidence of it at high frequencies in New Zealand rivers. And some strains are resistant to 16 to 32 times 
the clinical breakpoint concentration. What does that mean? The clinical breakpoint concentration is the maximum concentration of drug you can give a patient, either because it's no longer soluble above those concentrations or because it's so toxic to the patient. These strains are resistant to 32 times the maximum amount of drug you can give a patient. So how do we get to this point? Well, if we think about antibiotic, antimicrobial resistance as a sort of ratchet effect, as we use these antimicrobial agents, we pull susceptible populations of bacteria towards becoming resistant populations of bacteria. And that ratchet moves in only one direction because it has a break. And our continued use of antimicrobial agents is that break. We are the ones who prevent the ratchet from moving backwards towards an earlier susceptible state in our environment. And that can be seen here when we put our ratchet on this little crane. So if this toolbox were a population of bacteria, we are ratcheting them up against gravity to a state of high resistance, high frequencies of resistance, because of our use of antimicrobial agents. The simple hypothesis, then, is that if we stop using these drugs, naturally these populations will fall back to that ground level of susceptibility. And that's often what you hear for some of the strategies. If only we used these drugs less, if only we used them only when we needed to, if only we didn't use them in agriculture. Unfortunately, when we test that hypothesis, it's not very robust. When we introduce a new drug, there's often a good period, a lag period here, where every infection we treat with that drug, drug responds. Then resistance begins to emerge, and it increases in frequency with the ratchet of the antimicrobial uh, break. Attempts then to suspend use level off resistance frequency, and it starts to decline which looks like a very promising outcome for the simple hypothesis. But unfortunately, once resistance has evolved somewhere, it returns much faster the second time we introduce the drug. So you can get transient improvements in that frequency of resistance, but they go away within any kind of reasonable lifetime when you want to reuse that drug. So yes, if we'd use drugs less, use them only when appropriate, use them perhaps only in medicine, we may not have ever gotten out of this part of the curve. But that's not what we did. So we're here in the curve. And for the existing drugs we have, we now have to deal with this very complex ratchet-like system towards resistance. And that ratchet is being held down by more than just our use of antimicrobials. Once we turned the ratchet far enough, we get to a state where we perpetuate resistance because of a variety of both social and technological interventions. We have a multitude of different chemicals in our immediate environment. I'm going to talk more about these. Biocides, pesticides, preservatives, emulsifiers, surfactants, all of which can substitute for antibiotics to maintain antibiotic resistance even when we, we remove the antibiotic. Calls for new antibiotics to replace the ones that we've lost because of the way we use them might give us a small window of efficacy. But if we haven't learned the lessons from the old drugs, effectively, we're just stealing these new drugs from the next generation. 
because we will cause resistance to the new drugs, and that's a type of intergenerational theft. And one of the most powerful social uh, mechanisms for maintaining resistance is our own financial incentive systems and intellectual property rights instruments. New drugs are patented. The incentive with a patent is to sell as much of that product as you can during the limited life of the monopoly. And that's why drugs are sold in agriculture as prophylactics, why they're sprayed from airplanes on apples and kiwi fruit. Sell as much as you can while you have the monopoly. And this is why chemistry becomes so much a part of this talk. It's now raining chemistry. There are estimated to be over 140,000 brand new chemicals on Earth that have been invented since World War II alone. And your exposure, routine exposure, uh, is to 5,000 of them produced at the greatest volume. Examples are pesticides. This room is full of pesticides. It's here because it's in the carpet dust. It's here because you may have a pet who walked through a garden that had been treated with a herbicide or an insecticide. So we have pesticides now everywhere, including our food. Remember those forever chemicals I was telling you about, the PFASs that are used in plastics and flame retardants that are in your clothes? They are now coming out in the rain at concentrations above drinking water standards. You can't avoid the rain. The most popular herbicide, glyphosate-based herbicides, also come out in the rain in the US Midwest. And even in remote parts of the United States, microplastics are coming out in the rain, which means they're carried in the air, which means that it's not just touching your skin, you're breathing it in, and it's going through your lungs. Now, this is a testament to the power of chemistry. And chemistry can do wonderful things. Our capacity, our chemical capacity on Earth continues to grow, though, and it's growing faster than the human population. So we're producing more and more volume of more and more novel chemical agents per capita than we ever have in the history of Earth. So I want to bring those threads together. Remember I told you things like biocides and surfactants also contribute to resistance. And I'm going to tell you how in a couple of minutes. But first, I want to show you just how powerful that combination can be. Here you see four Petri dishes. And on those Petri dishes, we put bacteria. The bacteria grow to high densities in our laboratory, a billion per milliliter of water. So to count them, we have to dilute them. For the drinking game, this is my first dilution series. We do dilution series to enumerate those bacteria. And the number here is the factor of 10 by which the culture has been diluted. It goes out to number 9. Number 9 is a billion-fold dilution. And there's one spot. So there was still one bacterium after diluting the culture a billion times that tells us there were a billion bacteria per milliliter on the most permissive condition. If we infuse that medium with a herbicide, in this case a dicamba-based herbicide, but no antibiotic, we still count a billion bacteria per milliliter. If we put them on a plate that has an antibiotic, we don't see any bacteria. So this strain, completely susceptible to the antibiotic. And the highest concentration we put on the plate was here, 10 to the 3. 
which means that in that spot there were one million bacteria applied to the plate, and none of them grew. The antibiotic is completely effective at killing those bacteria. But in that same medium, if we mix together the herbicide dicamba and the antibiotic, 100% of the bacteria grow. All of those bacteria are able to now tolerate that antibiotic at previously lethal concentrations, even though there's no chemical similarity between the herbicide and the antibiotic. Of all those 140,000 products that are in circulation, none are tested for these kinds of effects on bacteria. Now we've tested now a number of different pesticides. The commercial formulations, Roundup, Camba, 2,4-D, as well as some of their active ingredients and some of their inert ingredients. Among the inert ingredients, are those compounds that are called surfactants. This is polysorbate 80 or tween 80 and carboxymethyl cellulose. They're added to herbicides to help them spread on a plant and be more efficacious at killing the plant. But you might also notice that these are also used in food. They change the word, then it's called an emulsifier. So processed foods use emulsifiers. They're the same things. When they're used as emulsifiers, there's a concentration limit to their use. We've tested the effects of these emulsifiers on bacteria like E. coli and Salmonella and Terica to see if they also altered the response of these bacteria to antibiotics. Now, that's what this kind of dull table is showing you here at the bottom. In summary, these responses are a change in the antibiotic efficacy between zero and 400%. So even the inert ingredients in these common products can change the response of bacteria to antibiotics. We see two kinds of responses. Here on the top, we see a change in the concentration of the antibiotic needed to kill the bacteria. So in the, when, the, when you combine that chemical agent in the antibiotic, it takes more antibiotic to kill the bacterium. That's an interaction increase in resistance. Or we see a shift towards greater susceptibility. Sometimes that agent makes the bacterium more susceptible to the antibiotic, and that interaction is a decrease, then, in resistance. Now, you might be tempted to think, great, right? I'll just take my Roundup with my tetracycline. <laughs> but I'm going to argue against that. Just stay with me. First, let's look at the interaction increases. When we mix two agents together, an antibiotic and an agent that increases resistance to that antibiotic, in short-term evolution experiments, and this, for example, is the herbicide Roundup coupled with the antibiotic ciprofloxacin, what these numbers are telling you is that high-level ciprofloxacin resistance emerges in that population 10,000 times faster when Roundup is around. So even at the sublethal concentrations of these agents, they shift the fitness curve to select for bacteria that become more and more resistant to the antibiotic. But what about when those chemicals make you more susceptible, make the bacteria more susceptible. This is a slightly longer experiment. It is going to be the apex of complexity of the talk. I say that to warn you, but stick with me. I'll be gentle. And if that's not enough, you can have a short nap. Okay. 
So we're going to talk about two E. coli brothers. They differ in only one gene. They're nearly clones. And they are going to battle to the death in this experiment. We call those two E. coli E. coli 1 and E. coli 2. E. coli 1 is more susceptible to the antibiotic tetracycline than is E. coli 2. That's the one genotype difference. In round one, we put both of these E. coli into the same test tube, small numbers of them, and we incubate them so that they grow up into larger, dense populations of E. coli. These are the types of evolution experiments. Now, these two bacteria are both equally fit. That is, the number of them in the tube is equal. We start with equal at the concentrations up to about 0.1 micrograms per mil of tetracycline. They stay equal. When the concentration of tetracycline starts to get a little higher, one of the strains starts to win. That is, E. coli 2 is more fit than E. coli 1, and E. coli 1 starts to disappear from the population. That's called evolution. It is happening here at far below the concentration that we would call the inhibitory concentration for tetracycline. This is happening well below a concentration that will kill E. coli 1. But even at very, very low concentrations of antibiotics, the susceptible strains start to show that they're less fit than resistant strains. So this is just round one. We can prove that these two E. coli, under most conditions, are equally fit. And even in the presence of tetracycline, remain equally fit until we get to a threshold concentration of the drug. In round two, we do the same experiment, but we add the herbicide Roundup. And this is what you see. You see that fitness curve, that competition, shift to the left. The concentration now at which strain two wins in the competition against strain one, that concentration of tetracycline is much lower. Now, Roundup makes you more susceptible to tetracycline, makes E. coli more susceptible to tetracycline. And, though, and therefore, it makes some sense that if you're more susceptible, the curve should shift to the left. And it takes less tetracycline now to distinguish the winner. The outcome of that, though, is not a reprieve from the problem of antibiotic resistance, because both types of interactions, those that increase and those that decrease resistance, have the same effect, but in different environments. So if an interaction increases resistance, then bacteria that are naturally more resistant to that antibiotic evolve faster where antibiotics are used at higher concentrations. And those are places like us, or hospitals, or in our pets, and in our livestock. But where an agent makes, an ant makes a bacterium more susceptible to the antibiotic, it takes less antibiotic to evolve resistance. So those are going to be places where antibiotics are found at lower concentrations. Those are environments, such as in our surface waters wastewaters, our urban gardens, our pets, and in parks. Environmental concentrations of antibiotics become more important for the evolution of antibiotic resistance when an agent makes the bacterium more susceptible to the antibiotic. So don't drink Roundup with your tetracycline. And that segues me now more to the environment. Because antimicrobial resistance isn't just a human health issue. It's also important for our pathways to nutrition and our biodiversity. 
we've chosen to start looking at a model organism for environmental interactions, and that's the bee. Bees are important pollinators. If it's a honeybee, it's also an industry because of the production of honey. But these invertebrates are exposed to industrial and agrochemical chemicals all the time. They're at the intersection of, of industrial chemicals and antibiotics. And the antibiotics either come from people, such as to protect the hive, or they come from nectar and pollen because plants make antimicrobial agents. So they are a great environmental indicator of that combination. And we also have evidence that the bacteria in the bee, some of which cause disease, most of which protect the bacterium from disease-causing bacteria. So it's an important ecosystem to look at the potential effects of things like agrochemicals undermining the natural antimicrobial compounds of plants and the bee gut microbiota for protecting the bees. And that's what inspired the title for the talk, where that bartender is asking to the bee, what's your poison? A previous master's student, Fu, started to look at some of the effects on bacteria that are known to be opportunistic pathogens of bees. So he did a combination of a glyphosate-based herbicide, number eight, ciprofloxacin and the antibiotic streptomycin and ampicillin. He found that the combination of the glyphosate herbicide and ciprofloxacin decreased the efficacy of the antibiotic 64-fold, streptomycin 16-fold and increase the susceptibility of Seracia for, to ampicillin by fourfold. So he sees both interactions with different combinations. We know some from work in the US that Seracia tends to become a pathogen when the bee is exposed to Roundup, to glyphosate-based herbicides, because the glyphosate-based herbicide is more toxic to the protective microbiota of the bee and the seracia tends to grow. Well, we wanted to take, take a step back and say, could this be a reasonable link? Could our use of herbicides in any way really in the real world be affecting bee microbiota? And I won't have the answer for you tonight. Tessa Hiscox, a new PhD student, this is the journey she's about to embark on, but I am gonna give you a little insight into the one experiment I've seen her do, yeah. <laughs> which is to ask the question about whether bees are attracted to herbicides. Because we also know from the late Steve Ratton's group at Lincoln that bees like salty water. I happen to know from Twitter that plant biotechnologists like to drink herbicide and they report that it tastes salty. A hypothesis forms. Herbicides taste salty, and bees like salty water. Do bees get attracted to water that's contaminated by herbicides, say through spray drift? So Tessa has begun to test that hypothesis. And so far, what she's done is looked at three hives over three weeks. These are bumblebees. And she gives them the option of pure water, which they really don't seem to like much. And then she gives them water with different concentrations of herbicide, low concentrations of herbicide to high concentrations, both within um, the parameters that we might expect to find in the environment. And then also some water that has herbicide and the magic salt mixture that Ratten's group had identified. And what she finds is a statistically significant relationship that says that the bees, bees do prefer herbicide over pure water. They tend to prefer the lower concentrations of herbicide to the higher concentrations. 
the lower concentrations are the ones that you're most likely to find in the environment. And as long as there's salt in that water, they'll drink it no matter how much herbicide is in there. So we already have the first plank in this puzzle about whether bees may be not just influenced by these herbicides because of their direct toxic effects on the bee, but they also may be drawn to them or oblivious to them, and that's altering their gut microbiota and the ability to self-medicate. So my conclusions. First, antibiotic resistance is an international existential threat. Don't underestimate it. Don't be just carried away by climate change. There are other ways for you to die. <laughs> resistance is everywhere. It's not just in our hospitals. It's in our environment. And those raise the risks for all of us, including our companion animals. It's not just a problem for human health, but it's also a problem for agriculture and biodiversity. I mean, we know from the pandemic what effects can happen when infectious disease threatens our daily lives. New drugs will not save us if we use them the same way we used the old drugs. That is a sort of insanity. Inventing new drugs only to lose them because we haven't addressed the causation of their failure over time. And it's not that the medical rationale is wrong. What is wrong in Maine is our social structures, not our technology. We have social and legal systems that embed an incentive to create antibiotic resistance over drug efficacy. And the good news is, possibly, if we remove all of those breaks from the ratchet, we might learn how to rehabilitate the old drugs again. But it's going to require us to look holistically at our chemical exposome and the tendency to try to invent new chemistries, commercialize those chemistries before the full range of effects of those chemicals is tested, not just in human health, but on these sublethal effects on disease-causing bacteria. Before I stop, I just want to ask my research group to maybe stand up so that you can see them clearly and thank them once again for their hard work. OK, come on, don't steal the show. Sit down. <laughs> And now what I'd like to do is invite you, um, if any of you have any questions, I'm supposed to um, ask you to ask questions uh, rather than to make statements. Uh, but if nobody asks anything, I'll, I'll gladly take a statement. Um, but uh, please, if you can, start off with questions, uh, and I will try to answer them. Please. Yeah. Um, now, first off, that was just one type of resistance that that, oh, the question, the question was, why in the uh, picture uh, of the map of the world with resistances, why, why was resistance so high in some countries, so much higher in some countries? First, this is just one type of resistance. This is not all antibiotic resistances. If we had a map of all antibiotic resistances, the color range would probably be smaller. But this is uh, extended spectrum beta lactamases, which are really, really frontline and meant to be exclusively used, used in human medicine. The light colored countries may also be countries in which data is hard to get. So don't take gray as safe. Gray is probably not funded to do the surveillance. That leaves us now with brown, red, and really dark blood red as our choices. And there's probably several different reasons why we're seeing what we're seeing. 
Some countries sell frontline antibiotics over the, count, over the counter. And therefore, humans are using them at higher levels than is warranted. Every country uses too much, but some countries have more regulatory control on how much they're used. Some countries have enacted more stringent controls on the use of these drugs in agriculture than have other countries. India stands out as being very uh, red in this picture. India is also the country that makes a lot of our commercial antibiotics. And it's known that those factories leak. So there's direct spread to the environment as well as lower stringency prescriptions in those countries, countries like India. So this map is also, is, is two things. It's a map of who is doing the research to tell us the answer, and a little bit of a map about how important regulation is to maintaining socially good technologies like antibiotics. Thank you. Yes, please. For the vaccine. Yeah. yeah. What about the Yes, okay. Thank you. So I'm going to just repeat the question. Um, truly, my talk was on kind of chemotherapeutics like antibiotics and these antimicrobial agents. But we also hear a lot now about using RNA as um, a biologically active material that might have application not just in a vaccine to raise our own immune response, but might be used as an antibacterial or uh, a anti-insectal, an insecticide, uh, and or something that would kill other kinds of organisms. We already know RNA is used as an insecticide. There are genetically modified crop plants that have been produced that kill some of the pests that feed on these plants. They've been modified to produce a form of RNA that when the insect eats it, is converted into a toxic version, toxic to them, version of that RNA. And the way it's toxic is it induces a reaction within the normal gene expression machinery of the cell that causes an essential gene to no longer be expressed. And then the insect dies from lack of, of using that gene. We also know that RNAs can be very important for regulation in all organisms, from bacteria through to human beings. A good part of your genome is controlled by small RNA molecules. So RNA is not just a intermediary between your DNA genome and the proteins you make. It's also a very important active player in the level of gene expression in your cells. So we already know that RNA can be used as a lethal agent in particular circumstances. We're continually being surprised at how many organisms are responding to these agents, and we don't know the answer yet. The good thing about the vaccine program is that those adverse effects, if they exist, can be tested because you are testing them uh, throughout the process and it's limited in exposure to people. There is the possibility, though, that when you move outside of that context, agricultural uses, environmental uses, that there will be exposures we can't see and therefore can't anticipate and measure before we use them. So the use of RNA 
can be really powerful. And it can be used to substitute for potentially more toxic, synthesized chemical agents. But it is new days, early times for that technology, and we don't know how far it could go outside of confined medical use. Thank you. Any other questions? Wait a minute, I said that maybe we get the drugs back. So the question was, is there, is there any good news? I mean, listen folks, it's warmer in here than outside, you know? <laughs> maybe that makes you happy. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, so, so the question was, um, you know, we're stuck between not having those new drugs and also having lots of resistant bacteria. So is there a generation who's going to take a differential hit on this? Uh, yes. We, um, we live in the era when the hit is beginning. We've known for decades that it was coming. When I, when I got on the airplane to move to New Zealand, uh, I was going through the LA airport, and the two biggest news magazines of that era, Time and Newsweek, both ran front covers on antibiotic resistance, and that was 1994. And they used the word apocalypse. So just like with climate change, We've known this is coming for a long time, but the commercial incentives to sell these drugs is strong. And well, we had always hoped that we could invent more faster than we would lose the efficacy of those we had. And that was wrong. So we get superbugs now. We get hospital wards that are closed. We get people dying of infections that used to be curable for that short period in history between World War II and this, the beginning of this century. The future, though, for those of you who said, is there any good news, um, this won't be it. So the future is a little less uh, comfortable even than what I'm describing because at some point, hospitals are going to have to assess the risk of, say, giving you a hip replacement, or um, fixing, um, fixing some kind of bone abnormality that requires surgery. They'll have to assess that versus the possibility that you'll survive the infection that comes after surgery. And more and more frequently, they will assess that as a no-go. So we will live more painful, debilitating lives from routine surgeries that we used to have access to. And we are, and mainly our children, and our grandchildren are, where the bite will most occur. Uh, to kill people, or, or was it? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I see. That's your, oh, okay. So sometimes it's better not to have the operation anyway. <laughs> yeah, okay. I know. So he, he says that maybe it's better off sometimes to adjust our expectations because um, in, in his case, his mother, uh, who had a hip replacement, was it? Um, really never recovered even though she had those antibiotics for two years and maybe she would have been better off not going through that. And that, that's an, an easier calculus, I think, when the person is, is old. It's a much more difficult calculus when the person is a child or a young adult 
and may have to live many decades with the pain um, of that cor otherwise correctable problem. Um, so yes, it, it may not be uh, such a bad thing in some way um, in, in that context, but for many others, it probably will be. Um, and, but, but what I think is the good news here is that if you're going to address a problem, you have to at least recognize it. And it's getting to the point now where we can't turn away from the fact that uh, antibiotic resistance and potential pathogens are all around us. It's not just a hospital phenomenon. And that we have to rethink our incentive is incentive private, uh, using uh, private corporations to develop our drugs, becoming, resistant, becoming dependent upon them. Um, and on the intellectual property rights instruments they need in order to form a profit from having invested in that drug discovery. We do have an option to take that back to the public sector and uh, to also rethink how we reward the innovation that leads to our new drugs. All right. It's a little bit after 8 o'clock. I want to thank you once again for coming and drive safely home. <laughs>